a special welcome to all the dads in the house. Happy Father's Day, guys. Awesome. So you've already had the flyover, the parade's about to happen in a little while, so I'm sure they've got all the festivities planned in your honor. But we wanted to take a moment as we uh, get into the message for a little while just to honor all the dads in the room. So, and if you're watching online, you can play along too. So fathers, would you stand? If you're a dad, stepdad, granddad, father figure in the life of some young person, would you stand? <clears throat> would you remain standing, guys? I have to say remain, I, I want to say remain standing. I know how hard it is to get back up. So if you'll, if you'll just remain standing. I just want to pray over you guys and just ask a special blessing for you, a Father's Day blessing. And ladies and, and all the other folks in the house, would you join me in praying for your special dad that's in the room now? Let's pray over these guys. Father, thank you for these men who are in this room and those who are watching online. Thank you, Father, for the role that they play in the lives of so many young people. Thank you for how much they mean to their families. And Father, on this Sunday, where they could be anywhere, they've chosen to be here for this time, I pray you'll bless them and honor them. I pray you'll lift the burden that they carry from them. Every one of these men have needs in their life. They're broken in some place in their life. And so, Father, I pray that you will do what only God can do, and that is to touch the deepest need represented in the lives of these men. Protect them physically, emotionally, spiritually. Father, go before them. I pray that you will encourage them, bless their families as they just love on them today and tell them how much they're appreciated. And we as a church, we bless them and we want to honor them today as well. Thank you for them. And I pray this will be a great day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. When you study the Bible, what you find is as you read the Bible, uh, the Bible says concerning itself in 1 Peter that there's no scripture, no verse that you read that has a private interpretation meaning you can't lift a passage out of the Bible and bend it and make it say anything you want it to say. Now, you see that happen sometimes. People get some twisted theology and some strange psychology and, and point to the Bible. Well, you, you, you can't torture Scripture and make it say what you want it to say. So the Bible says there's no Scripture of any private interpretation. So when you study the Bible, you would ask yourself this question, what did it mean then? Because you want to understand it in its context. And then you would ask your second question, what does it mean now? Not that the, the meaning has necessarily changed, but the way in which you apply it may have changed. And then the third thing you would ask yourself as you study the Bible is, what does it mean to me? You know, what can I get out of the passage that I have uh, just read? And so those are basic, um, you know, principles of studying God's Word, but I wanted to lay that out before you because the passage we're going to look at, there is an interpretation to the text that I'll share with you. But the heart of my message is not in the interpretation, but in the application of the text. Now remember, there's no scripture of any private interpretation. However, a scripture may have more than one application. And the rule by which you understand if the scripture is being applied in the right way is did the way in which you apply it violate any other scripture or biblical principle? If you take an application and you would apply it in a way that it violates scripture somewhere over here, you haven't proper, properly applied the word. Let me give you an illustration. In Revelation 3, uh, you have this uh, verse that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice, let him uh, open the door and I'll come in and fellowship with him. Now, when I was a kid in my dad's church, we had Sunday school. And in Sunday school, boys and girls, there was a thing called flannel graph. Have you ever heard of the word flannel? Google it. It's a real thing, flannel graph. It was a, a board covered in cloth. And you had these cut out images of biblical characters. And so they would, and it had something on the back that would kind of help stick to the flannel graph. So as they would teach, the Sunday school teacher would teach, they'd put different images up to help the kids uh, understand. And I have a vivid memory of my Sunday school teacher teaching Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And there was this image of Jesus, or maybe he was a member of Grateful Dead, I don't know, but he looked like, he looked... He looked kind of Jesus-y, and he was, uh, he was there, and so he's knocking on this door, and my Sunday school teacher said, now, boys and girls, that's Jesus knocking on your heart's door. Well, that's a good application of that text, and in reality, he does essentially knock on our heart's door. He desires to have a relationship with everyone in the room and all of you watching online. There's a sense in which you could apply that to the idea God knocks on the heart door. But that's not the interpretation. 
The interpretation of it in Revelation 3 is Jesus is outside the door of one of his own churches wanting in. Well, that's even worse, right? I mean, he's knocking on the door. Hey, you guys have done this without me. I'd kind of like to be a part of your church if that's cool. If I'm knocking, I'm wanting in. And so the point is, that's the interpretation. But there's an application that works as well. Well, I say that to say when you go to my text this morning in Malachi 4, it's one verse, and the interpretation of Malachi 4 is a prophecy. And the prophecy is speaking of a time when God will send his prophet, and the purpose of the prophet is to prepare the way of the Lord to turn the hearts of the people back toward God. And so the prophecy was fulfilled, the Malachi 4 prophecy was fulfilled by Luke 3, when instead of it being Elijah that returned to prepare the way of the Lord, it was John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah, the Bible says, who had that role of preparing the way of the Lord. So as I read my text to you this morning, you understand it is a prophecy, prophecy speaking of the coming of one who will uh, essentially turn the hearts of the people back toward God and turn uh, the, uh, the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, right? So let's look at it in a, a Malachi 4, and then I want to take a, an application on Father's Day and hopefully uh, encourage you guys today. Malachi 4, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he'll turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. And then he puts this warning, else I'll come and strike the land with total destruction. So here is a promise that impacts the home. And I can tell you the significance of a home, the significance of a family, whether it's a single parent home, whether it's a, a more traditional style family where mom and dad are there, regardless of the configuration of your home, I cannot overemphasize the significance of the home when it comes to the Bible. You see, the first institution that God ever established when you read Genesis was he established a home. Uh, he placed Adam and Eve in the garden. They had children. Uh, after the fall in Genesis 3, they were taught a form of worship. God would be worshiped through a sacrifice. It would be a blood sacrifice because that was foretelling of the coming of, the, of, of Jesus, the Messiah, who would go to the cross and shed his life's blood. So the Old Testament saints were saved looking forward to the day Jesus would come to the cross and die and be raised again. You and I are saved today by looking back at the cross, believing one day Jesus did come and die and was raised again for the salvation of our sin. So the message of the cross was in uh, the, the, that first family, the, uh, the understanding of the blood sacrifice. After all, that's what led to the first murder in the Bible. Have you ever thought about it? The first murder in the Bible happened over religious differences. <laughs> Are is anybody surprised? I mean, it happened over, I mean, here was Cain and Abel, these two brothers. Uh, Abel understood clearly a blood sacrifice, so he brought a blood sacrifice and offered it, and the Bible says God received the sacrifice and was honored. Abel, uh, Cain, on the other hand, brought a sacrifice from the ground, the fruit of the ground, and God did not receive his sacrifice. And he didn't receive Cain's sacrifice because it was not a blood sacrifice, and we all know you can't get blood out of a turnip. <laughs> so the point is, that created some consternation and conflict between the brothers, and Cain rises up and kills his brother Abel over that religious difference. But I just wanted to just drive that thought home to you that the first institution in the Bible was the home. God established, so, so don't underestimate how important your family is to God. Dads, how important your role. Mom, how important your role. Kids, how important your, there's something very sacred and something very special about a family. Now I'll say that right up front, there's no perfect families. I wasn't raised in one, didn't have one, don't have one now. There, there are no little houses on the prairie in the room. So let yourself breathe just a minute. There's no perfect families, there's no perfect homes, there's never been, there never will be. But all of us uh, understand that God loves our families and he loves us and we have a significant role to play in the lives of children. There's a generational impact, as we'll talk about, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a family. So you have this idea that the first institution in Genesis was the home, and then when the Old Testament closes out, it closes out with our text, and that is putting the emphasis again back on the home. 
Remember, he will turn the hearts of the fathers toward the children, and he'll churn, turn the children's hearts back toward the father. So again, here is an emphasis God's placing. He opens the Old Testament and closes it with the significance of a family. And if you think about it, as the family goes, so goes a church. As a church goes, so goes a community, because a church is salt and light in a community. As a community goes, so goes a country. So the significance of a family and the significance of a home, regardless of what your home looks like today, it cannot be overstated. You have a very special, a very sacred responsibility. And by the way, your first responsibility is to your home. Your first responsibility to your family, if you're looking for good priorities, I start with a biblical order. In the beginning, God. That's where he started. That's a good place to start. Now, when I say in the beginning, God, I don't mean God in relationship to your religion. I don't mean God in your church. I mean God in relationship to your relationship. He ought to be first. Remember, he said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's very jealous of that. So when I say your priority should be God, that means you put him first in your life. Um, you begin your day in his word. You spend some time in prayer. Um, connect these spiritual disciplines to something you do every day. People say, I just don't have time to read God's word. You, you really do. You have to make time. You open your day up, spend a little time in God's word, spend time in prayer. You say, I don't really have time to pray. If I pray, I don't know what to pray about. Well, connect prayer with something you do every day. You drive, maybe spend some time in prayer. God knows you should pray if you're driving around here today. <laughs> so these disciplines can be done. You just have to purpose to do them. And so God is the priority. And then the second priority is that home. He established the home. I think our families is the second priority in relationship to God. That was the first thing he established, right? Here's God in the beginning, God. Then you see him placing this family together. And then after placing the, this couple together, here along comes the kids. So the kids ought to be in there as a priority. So I've got God, uh, uh, my relationship to him. I, I have uh, the relationship to my spouse. I have a relationship to my kids. And then God told Adam, take care of the garden. Keep this place. You have a responsibility. Be a good steward of all that I've created. Be, be responsible as a citizen. Be responsible as a business person. Take care of your business. <laughs> That's important. So he took care of the garden. And then the fourth thing was, he established a form of worship. Now, again, an application of that would be a relationship to a church, somewhere you attend where you can receive God's word, somewhere where you can not only receive, but you can in turn give, where you can support it with your finances, support it with your, with your time. We need to be a part of that. We need to be a part of a family. It's important that you have a home, a church home. So those are, I can give you those five. Now, you can put behind it friendships, you can put behind it, you know, whatever you want to put. But I'm just saying, you need to establish some priorities because your life will be guided by the priorities you establish or by the pressures other people put on you. If you don't decide what's important in your life, somebody else will. And you go through life like a pinball in a pinball machine, just bouncing off the bumpers and off the levers and responding and reacting instead of being proactive and taking charge of your life. So there comes a time when I have to stop and think about my life, and it's the first point I wanted to make, have some situational awareness. Understand that I'm large and in charge of me. Nobody can be spiritual for me. People can pray for me, but people can't do my praying for me. Like no one can eat for you and it benefits you. No one can exercise for you and it benefits you. But wouldn't that be awesome? Can, can I just, this Father's Day, let play along. Can, can you imagine, wouldn't that be the most amazing thing? We have a lot of trainers in our church and I could, I, it'd be worth the money to pay somebody to work out for you. Wouldn't that be awesome? Get you a bowl of Bluebell, <laughs> and go to the gym and say, you know what, dude? I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need a few more miles on that treadmill. And by the way, kick that up to about a seven. We're not doing this four and five thing. Come on, man. As I pour syrup over my bluebell. And then I walked out of there, man, ripped. I'm in shape, I'm in shape now, but it's round. You know, <laughs> I walk out of there in a different form, a different shape, right? Wouldn't that be great? But my point is, nobody can, nobody can have spiritual discipline and it benefit me. Your wife can't be spiritual for you. You have to eat for yourself. You have to exercise for yourself. You have to read scripture for yourself. You have to pray for yourself. 
It's, it, and by the way, there's not a church in the world that can give you everything you need in one hour to get you through your week. Just not there. There's a value of corporate worship. Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, the gathering as some do. So there, there's a, a value of me seeing you, you seeing me, getting to shake hands, hug, seeing other people, knowing we're not in this alone. So there's a value in that. There is a value in that. I understand that. But the point is, there's not a church, I don't care who, and we have some great churches in the area. We have some great churches within driving distance of this church. Wonderful churches, great teachers, great preachers, all that great worship, you can get it just about anywhere. But the point I'm making is, no matter the church that you may choose to attend, you cannot get everything you need in one service to get you through your week. So I said, well, I'm just not going deep enough. I just need to go, go deeper. Well, really, that's not on your church. That's more on us. Here's, here's good news and bad news. Would you like good news and bad news? Here's, here's the good news. You can have all of God you want. Isn't that good news? You can have all of God you want. Just load up on some Jesus. <laughs> He's available. You can just get, you, get your Jesus on. So I said, I'm going to church to get my worship on. You can, you can worship 24-7. Man, with the internet, you can hear some of the greatest music in the world. You can just worship till it runs out your ears. You can have you a worship fest. You can have, the good news is you can have all of God you want. Are you ready for the bad news? The bad news, you have all God you want. <laughs> I'm my biggest problem. I can be in as good of a shape as I commit myself to be in. Ooh, man, that stung. That hurt a brother. Especially on the day we've been giving everybody donuts. <laughs> that kind of bad. The point is, no, it's really good. But the point I'm making is uh, I, I have to be disciplined. I, 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 it, it's like you have that donut, now you're like, I'm done with the donuts. I'm not going to eat another donut. No, I, I guarantee you I'm going to be done in 10, 15 minutes. And when I'm done, you're going to go eat. I talked to a couple that left this morning. They said they were going to Babes. His father said they're hitting Babes. It's one of my favorite go-tos when I need comfort food. <laughs> Babe, right? Get fried chicken and chicken fried steak. And some of that food will be in heaven one day, you know. And so you go to Babe's and you load up on that fried chicken, get you some of that gravy and, oh man, some of that corn and those biscuits and some, you know, some honey on that thing. Stay away from that molasses, man, that tree sap. You don't want any of that. But you, you get all that. And, and here's what you do if you're like me. You walk out of Babe's and you're going, I'll never eat again. I am so full. I, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I'm ashamed of myself. God, Father, forgive me. I, I lost my mind in there. And you get in the car. But let me tell you, if you're anything like me, about 6 o'clock this evening, 7 o'clock this evening, a brother's hung, a stomach's going to be going, hey, hey. Your stomach's going to be going, hey, hey, dude. Babes is a long ways away. And that, that was a long time ago. You're going to get hungry again. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to eat again. Because that one meal was not enough to get you through the day, much less through your week. If it could, then what you'd do is just, I'm gonna meditate on babes. That message was so good, I'm just gonna meditate on it. Um, I'm just gonna meditate on the message. No, you, you, you have to learn to eat on your own. That's why it doesn't matter what kind of worship experience you have or what church you attend or how much word you get in that hour, you're there. You gotta eat on your own or it's not gonna benefit you. And the spiritual awareness comes, fellas, when we start owning our own faith and owning our own spiritual growth. And when you read the text, what's obvious is the heart of these people, it was not in a right relationship with God. So the second thing you see when you study this was not only a, situ a situational awareness, but it's what I call a, str uh, a, a spiritual alignment. A spiritual alignment. God turned the heart. Do you see that? God turned the heart. He turned the hearts of the fathers and he turned the hearts of the children, but it was God. It, there was a spiritual alignment. So if I'm drawing an application, what I'm saying, if I'm owning my own faith and I'm saying, you know what, I could do a lot better with these spiritual disciplines. I need to spend more time in God's word. I need some more time in prayer. I need some more, more time with my kids. I need to do better at home. I need to make a more meaningful connection with the people who know me best and love me most. It is a divine institution that I've been avoiding and neglecting. So I need to reorient myself to my home once again. And I start doing that. There is a, 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 a dynamic that's starts to happen in my life and in my home when you make a spiritual alignment. You're acknowledging the fact that God has the power to change your life, change your heart, and by the way, to change your home. 
Isn't it interesting that he talks about in the spiritual alignment, he talks about what gets turned, it's the heart. He didn't say the job, he didn't say the business, he didn't say the house, he didn't say the car. <laughs> he said, I'm gonna turn the heart. Now, why is that important? Because in Proverbs 4, the Bible says, out of our hearts flow all of the issues of our life. Everything begins and ends with our heart. That's why once I have kind of a situational awareness of where my heart is in relation to God and my family, and then I begin to you know, have a spiritual alignment, I'm trying to adjust and reprioritize my life, all of a sudden God has an ability to start doing something very significant in me. Because your heart, your heart, that part that God turns, the part of you that all the issues of your life flow out of is not the muscle that's pumping blood through your body. When the Bible speaks of your heart, believe with your heart, it involves three elements of your life. It involves your intellect. You don't check your brain in a car and let some pastor think for you. You think for yourself. Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together. You think about it. You weigh it out. You reason with it. It involves your intellect. It, it involves not only your intellect, it involves your emotion. It, you can feel something. You have an emotional experience sometimes, good, bad, happy, sad. And then it involves your will. It changes what you do. It, it, even today, I spent some time with my kids and grandkids last night, and I love the little cards the kids make you. Uh, the, the babies made me. Each one of them wrote me a, a little note and made a card. And you know what was on all three of those cards? A heart. They drew a heart because a heart represents everything you are. When you tell somebody, I love you with all my heart, what you're telling them is with everything I am, I love all that you are. I, I can't love you more. <laughs> my mind, my will, my, every, I'm all in. I love you with my heart. So when the Bible says God wants to turn your heart the, the, the core of you, the part of you that all the issues of your life, he wants to turn the father's hearts toward the children and the children's hearts toward the father's. Don't miss this, guys. That is a spiritual action. That's why God has to be the priority of your life because you cannot keep your heart turned in the right direction and your children will not keep their hearts turned in the right direction if God is not in his proper place. So when I put God in his proper place and in my life and in my heart and in my home, then God begins a process of, of turning things. He can turn things. There's nobody too hard for him. There's no home too hard for him. There's no situation that he can't change. There's no, there's no qualifiers in the text. He turns the hearts one way. He turns the hearts the other way. So there is a spiritual alignment, I guess is my point, that, that we have to make. So as I assess where I am and I start making adjustments, you know what, I can do better with this. I'm gonna spend more time with my kids, my family. I'm gonna prioritize my life. I'm gonna make sure I'm honoring God in all my life. I'm, I'm gonna put together the things that I can, I'm gonna own what I can own. I can, I can fix what I can fix. So I'm gonna be responsible for those areas of my life. I'm gonna make the spiritual alignment. Here's the third thing that has to happen. And that is you, you need to take some strategic actions. You have to develop some disciplines or you, you won't be able to follow through. I read where a, uh, a habit takes about seven weeks to form. So when you try to break a bad habit and replace it with a better habit, uh, it's gonna take you about seven weeks before it feels sort of natural to you. Whether it's eating healthier, exercising, uh, what it, whatever, whatever point you wanna make in your life, whatever priority you wanna try to repro I'm just gonna say, it's not a one and done. And, and the more it benefits you, I found in my life, the harder it may be to follow through. It, it's just a crazy thing. It's almost like the better this is for my marriage or the better this is for my life, the, the better this is for me, the harder it may be, because you know, <laughs> if you're not running into the devil, maybe signs you're running with him. And one of the ways you know you're doing some good things is when all hell tends to come against you. So once you start saying, you know what, this is gonna be good for me, this is gonna be good for my relationship, this is gonna be good for my family, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reorder priorities. I'm just saying to you guys, it may take at least seven weeks before any of the changes in your life start feeling a little more natural. It's gonna take you that long. Even church attendance. I mean, during COVID, remember, we were locked down you know, stay away, we're all dying. During all that stuff, and we did, we played along. 
So well, during that time, people got out of the habit of going to church. And what you've got now is post-COVID, you've got people that it, 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 it's, it's, a hard, it's hard, it feels awkward. It feels weird. I have people come back and go, it feels so good to be here. It's so strange being away for so long. I mean, I get it. But the point is, it's going to take some time before it feels natural in any area of life. Attending church on a regular basis, uh, spending time having a date night, you know. It's going to be a little weird at first. But I'm just saying, if you'll adopt the spiritual disciplines of your life, it will begin to make a difference. So this is important and significant if you're going to see this kind of change happen in your, in your home. Here's the third, fourth thought. There is a satisfying achievement. There's a benefit. Let, let me give you an example. In Deuteronomy 6, it says we have a responsibility to transfer our knowledge and information to the next generation, right? Um, Deuteronomy 6 says one generation teaches the next. So spiritually, put that in a spiritual context, we have that opportunity. Now, here's what I have to tell you. We cannot make spiritual decisions for our children. Um, I'm going to say this and then I'll explain it. God has children, but he doesn't have grandchildren. No, I'm going to explain it. He has a personal relationship with everyone, meaning that I love my grandchildren with all my heart. I've got a little granddaughter in heaven, and I've got three little boogers here on the earth, and I think they're working on getting me some more. And that's going to be a sweet thing. My sweetheart's in heaven rocking that little granddaughter, I believe, this morning. But my point is, as much as I love my grandchildren, I cannot save them. I cannot make a decision spiritually that will impact their eternity. I can be an example to them. I can share my faith with them. But at some point, here's my point, our kids have to take ownership of their own faith. So, at some point, parents and grandparents, we transfer that legacy to our kids and we hope they embrace it. We, we hope they, they, they own their faith at some point. We hope they recognize the fact that they need a personal relationship with their Savior just as you and I need with our Savior. So there's this generational thing in Deuteronomy 6, and here's why that's important. When you read and study Judges and Joshua, there is a pattern that you began to see that develops where each generation becomes less spiritual than the generation preceding it. I'll illustrate it this way for my note takers. In Joshua chapter two, verse seven, it speaks of a generation that had firsthand experience of the power of God in their lives. Now, when Cindy and I started the Met Church 25 years ago, nearly 26 now, one of our motivations is, was that we wanted our kids to see God do something significant in our family. Starting a church is not unlike starting a business. I mean, you're putting a lot of things out there in the prayer, in the hopes that, you know, you did hear from God, that <laughs> you didn't just have pepperoni last night that's affecting your ability to think. You know, you really hope you heard from God. And so there's that scary moment. Some of you are business owners, and you know what I'm saying. There's that scary moment when you said, man, I, ooh, here we go, God. And so we wanted God to, we, to, to really reveal himself, and he did. I, I don't even have time to go into all the ways in which our kids have seen God. Work. What's my point? My point is we went somewhere with God we had never been before, and we experienced something from God we had never experienced before. Now, I'm not saying everybody ought to go out and start a business. Our God knows not another church. <laughs> you may hit one. Maybe have one that started in the parking lot while we're in here. They might hit it with your car on the way out. Be careful. So I'm just saying that, that make sure you're hearing from God. I, I, sometimes I preach these sermons and people leave going, Bill, that was it. I'm going to go start a business. I'm quitting my job. I'm going, whoa, stop. <laughs> make sure that was God, not Bill. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't want to lead you to do something God didn't lead you to do. But my point is, for Cindy and me, it was to go on a journey with God so that we could see him work. That's first generation experience. That's when you pray as a parent, God, I want to, and your kids are praying with you, and you see God work. And you can say, kids, this is how God does it. Isn't that cool? Well, by the time you get to Joshua chapter 24, verse 31, the next generation coming along, they didn't experience it firsthand. They heard about it. They heard about it. This generation experienced it. The second generation heard about it. They didn't experience it firsthand. They just heard about it. 
Man, I heard how mom and dad started to visit. I heard about how God worked in mom and dad's life. That's cool, I got a great story. This is how, but they, or maybe they were a part of the journey. And by the time that other generation comes along, they're not really on the journey, they just heard about the journey. Does that make sense? Am I tracking with you? I don't wanna lose you on this. It's really a good point. <laughs> and by the time you get to the third generation, and that's represented in Judges 2 verse 10, here's what happened with that generation. They didn't experience it, they didn't hear about it, and so they had no recollection, no knowledge about anything significantly spiritually that ever happened in their life. So you're three generations, if you buy that, away from potentially losing spiritual impact and a spiritual legacy within your home. You experience it, you hear about it, you neither experienced it or heard about it. So it's important that we see the value, guys, of keeping God in his proper place and honoring him in our homes in the way that we, that we should. Let me give you this and we'll go home. This morning, I had a guy catch me in the lobby and he said, Bill, I hadn't had a chance, we hadn't had a chance to talk. He said, you know, but I've been coming here for a few years. He said, um, um, I heard about the church and I heard that I should attend here when my, my son died. He said, I knew your wife had died. And the people that have heard you know that that permeates a whole lot of your messages and it's just kind of woven into that, you know, there's something about when your heart's been broken, it just, it just comes out. Little fissures in your soul shine the light out and people see it and hear it. And he said, so I've been coming here he said, this is probably the hardest day for me, Father's Day, for the obvious reason. But he said, I just felt like I needed to be here. And he said, I just wanted to thank you and thank this church for being loving and accepting and just being who you are. He said, just help me to be here today. And man, that just blessed me more than I could say. Because one of the things that I've really prayed for as I've gone through what I've gone through is that somehow... God can use the experience of brokenness to help somebody else. See, for some of you guys, Father's Day is a hard day. You may not have had a father in your life that you should have had. You might have had an abusive dad, an absentee dad, not a dad that really loved you, nurtured you, cared for you. That might not have been your experience. Some of you, like me, you got a dad in heaven. And so there's kind of an, a little bit of an emptiness on this day. But what I hope I hear you hear me say, fellas, is God knows. He knows your heart. He knows the difference you make in the lives of your children. And can I tell you, you are probably the greatest influencer in those kids' lives. Never under, mom's the heart of the home, but guys, let me tell you something. Every study you want to look at, every study you want to read, sociologist, psychologist, Everyone that's ever studied the dynamics of the family, say a father or father figure in the life of a child, has everything to do with their well-being, their health, their emotional development. I'm just saying, guys, don't estimate how important you are and how much you matter. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we've had on a Father's Day weekend to be a part of these services. And again, Lord, I just kind of go back to praying for my, my brothers. Many watching and many in the room. Some of them, like the man in the previous service, his heart's pretty heavy today. So minister comfort and grace to him. Some watching and some in the room today, their hearts are heavy. And some, they, they're good men. They've just gotten distracted doing good things. We realize, Lord, it's not bad or good. That's the biggest struggle that we men have. It's bad and there are good and best. Making a good decision or making the best decision. So Father, I pray that we'll really evaluate and assess where we are, all of us, and ask ourselves, are we, are we making a lot of good decisions or are we making the best decisions? And help us, Lord, to reorient ourselves and our homes back to you, to see you do amazing things in our life. I pray finally for anyone in the room or anyone watching who may never have trusted you as Savior. I pray for them right now that they'll just humble their heart 
and pray a simple prayer like this and say, Lord Jesus, with everything I know about me, I now trust all that I know about you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.